Let us start with recap. So in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, the 13th verse, what did Jesus call the scribes and the Pharisees? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Amen. Amen. Perfect. Perfect. And then, so looking at study question two, why did Jesus call them the above name? It says, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So I know there's a short version of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess my question is, if you're called a hypocrite, what does it usually mean? <laughs> you're not oh. practicing what you preach. A right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> right. Talking Literally. loud and saying nothing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> That's literally it. <laughs> telling the, the people to do one thing while they did yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the next thing, what spices did the Pharisees tithe with? And what did Jesus think about this behavior? And the, the verse of reference is Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 23. What were the spices? It was mint, cumin, mm -hmm. and and he, and I, and he, you got it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And what did Jesus think about this behavior? Was he okay with it? What do you think about it? Well, he, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. He, okay. He was fine with them tithing those spices. Mm -hmm. However, they did not, uh, you know, the spices were like the least of what, the tithing was the least that they could have done because they still weren't doing the other things that they were supposed to, which was showing ju uh, justice, mercy, and, and faith. Amen. So you, they were sweating the small stuff, but they were not doing the big stuff. Man, I tell you, couldn't have said it better. That is exactly it. No need to repeat. <laughs> right. All right. And then lastly, true or false, Jesus was happy with the Pharisees. He even states that they were so pious, they always cleaned the inside of <laughs> false. False. <laughs> yeah. Very false. Remember, he said they focused on the outside and they needed to cleanse the inside of the cup. So yes, very much so. Absolutely perfect. Well, all righty, now we got the juices flowing. Let us go ahead and just do a little bit of a recap. We ended on this particular uh, verse of scripture, but let us go ahead and reread it because it'll start uh, tonight's study. Will somebody please read Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verses 27 through 28. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hip, hip, hypocrisy, hypocrisy and wickedness. Amen, amen. So we see again, basically, <laughs> as we revisit it, obviously we talked about them cleaning the outside of the cup and not the inside. And Jesus basically, again, calls them hypocrites and talks about them focusing on how they look, you know, basically, but saying really what they would look like inside. So let us just go forth and look at some commentary concerning these whitewashed tombs. Will somebody please read the commentary according to Enduring Word, uh, Matthew 23, 27 through 28. Take us. Take us. Take us. Take us. Take us. You are like whitewashed tombs. It was the custom of the Jews at that time to whitewash the tombs in the city of Jerusalem before Passover so that no one would touch one accidentally, thus making themselves ceremony, un, excuse me, ceremony, ceremonially unclean. Jesus said these religious leaders were like these whitewashed tombs, pretty on the ice outside, but dead on the inside. You also outwardly appear righteous to men, Men might see them as righteous, but God does, did not. God is never fooled by what we show on the outside. He sees what we actually are, not what we appear to be to other men. Mm -hmm. I tell you, very good. I mean, basically, when we're looking at this, and obviously when Jesus kept focusing on that inner man and that innermost development, obviously that spirit is what we're looking at. It just reminds me of years ago, obviously, 
And I do believe there is certain decorum. So obviously, before I say this, I'm not trying to say this is, you know, they were right or wrong. But I know that going into a church, if you didn't have a certain type of dress, i.e. a suit and a tie, you know, if you came in with jeans and a shirt, it was kind of frowned down upon, you know. But basically, mm -hmm. the idea is it's really it kind of brings it full circle. It's really not about that outward appearance. As long as it's decent, you're not coming in with, you know, obviously things that are provocative, you know, basically, as long as that is. God doesn't look at that. He looks at what is inside and what you're bringing forth in that moment of worship and praise. So, it is mm -hmm. kind of go ahead. Oh no, I was agreeing. Okay, <laughs> it really kind of just reinforces that. So that's what kind of you know kind of triggered to me. Cool. Any other thoughts? All right, let us continue. So we look at now study question three uh, G, and it says. How are the Pharisees and scribes like whitewashed tombs? They look good on the outside, but are uh, unclean on the inside. Clean, exactly, are so, dead on the inside. You got it. So basically, that's exactly it. Jesus said to these religious leaders, you are like whitewashed tombs, pretty on the inside, pretty, excuse me, pretty on the outside, but dead on the inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let us continue. Going further in scripture, obviously getting, getting, getting deeper in Matthew 23, Jesus still speaking to those Pharisees and those teachers of the law. Will somebody please read the 29th through the 30, excuse me, through the 32nd verse. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. Hmm. We see Jesus really getting there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so basically he's saying, you guys, venerate these prophets but and then you say oh the people that killed them they were so horrible but he's saying basically you are those same people you know mm -hmm. maybe it's not physically killing them but obviously you're killing them with your acts and deeds because you're setting up a standard of leadership that is not of god basically you're doing all these negative things so people follow you and it leads them to death as well so he said mm -hmm. you might let us go ahead and finish the job your ancestors started because <laughs> yeah. basically you are the same <laughs> So let us look at a dirty word and actually pick out that piece of commentary as we go forth in this study. Will someone please read? You build the tombs. Go ahead. Oh, I'm echoing. <laughs> you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. They profess to venerate dead prophets but they rejected living prophets. In doing so, they showed that they really were the children of those who murdered the prophets in the days of old. You are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Jesus prophesied about how these leaders would complete the rejection of the prophets. Their fathers began by persecuting his disciples whom he would send to them. Mm, I got gotcha. you. Let us continue in scripture. Will someone please read for us Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verses 33 through 36. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barak, Barak, Barak mm -hmm. Mm -hmm whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come 
on this generation. Hmm. So obviously we see Jesus continue to tell them really about who they are and what they're doing. But specifically, I wanted to kind of focus in on those words, blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berkeah. So basically, I want you to kind of look at that because obviously we know one of them. Who, who was Abel? Adam and Eve's son. Adam and Eve's son, of course. Well, and we talk about the second, his, the second son. Second son, gotcha. So we talk <laughs> about his righteous blood, but then we also talk about Zachariah. So I wanted us to look at those pieces of scripture and also context. So I wanted us to look back to Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses four, uh, sorry, excuse me, verses one through 12. And it speaks to, of course, this Abel. So I'm going to read. It said, Adam made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If so, do what is right. Will you not be accepted? But if you do, do not what is right. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Will someone please continue in Genesis? Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Mm. Uh, we all are very familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. I would see uh -huh. one giving the better gift and the one who gave the subpar gift was angry. And it's funny, basically, in reading that, I didn't even realize how God spoke to him before he even did the deed, you know, saying sin wants to take you. Don't let it do it. But obviously sin did, you know, he killed his brother and that was the innocent blood that we see uh, shed and placed on the ground. So obviously that was the reference that Jesus was using that Genesis four verses one through 12. So, but I also wanted to look at Zechariah because this one was a little interesting because basically we see there is scriptural text, but obviously I wanted to kind of get more commentary for this one because there is, a, we'd be kind of piecing together a lot of uh, scripture. So. I think this commentary said it best. So will someone please read a uh, commentary about Zechariah uh, from GotQuestions.com? Read that, that's a lot of stuff. Prophet <laughs> Zechariah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just laughing. Uh, oh. <laughs> you guys have a hot mic in your, in your, in your truck. I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the prophet Zechariah is just one of over 30 men named Zechariah in the Old Testament. <laughs> His name means Yahweh has remembered, which might also be a good summary of the prophetic work that bears his name. We know little about Zechariah personally, except that he was a priest as well as a prophet and was a contemporary of Zerubbabel and the prophet Haggai. Zechariah uh, 1 1 introduces him as the son of Barika, Barikia, <laughs> the grandson of Ido. However, Ezra, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 14, identify him as the son of Ido. This is not a contradiction, as son can simply mean descendant according to Nehemiah chapter 12, verse four. Zechariah's grandfather, Edo, returned with Zerubbabel from exile in Babylon. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 16, <clears throat> lists Zechariah as the head of the priestly family of Edo. 
His ministry was among those who returned from the exile and their descendants as they resettled the land. Zechariah caused them to repentance and spiritual renewal in a time when they seemed to be des despairing, spiritually apathetic, and tempted to continue some of the sins of their forefathers before the exile. The prophecies in the book of Zechariah cover about two years time, but it appears that Zechariah continued to have a ministry among the people until the temple was rebuilt, even though no prophecies were recorded from that time period. Ezra chapter five, verses one and two. It says, oh, I think we're, uh, there we go. Gives us no indication about how Zechariah might have died. However, in Matthew 23, 34 through 36, Jesus mentioned Zechariah in his condemnation of the Jewish leadership of his time. I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah's son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come in this generation. It seems to be an obvious reference to the prophet Zechariah. Some scholars assume that Jesus was referring, well, excuse me, referencing another Zechariah, who 300 years prior to the prophet Zechariah was also killed in the temple environs. The other Zechariah, the John of Jehodiah, the priest, denounced the rulers for their sin. So they plotted against him by the order of the king. They stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. Second Chronicles 24 and 21. Since this Zechariah is the last martyr mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, as the book we know as Second Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew arrangement, many think that Jesus must be referring to this Zechariah. They explain Jesus' men mention of the son of Berica as a reference to a grandfather. But it's much more natural to assume that Jesus did indeed refer to Zechariah the prophet, since Jesus specifies that he is the son of Berica. The two martyrs Jesus mentions in Matthew 23 Abel and Zechariah are the first and last martyrs chronologically in the Old Testament period. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to kind of give us a little bit of commentary context. As you see, there was a lot going on with what the words that Jesus said, not that they were incorrect in any way, but basically wanted us to get a true clarification of what that meant and what the references were from. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So now that leads to our next study question. What did Abel and Zechariah, son of Berica, have in common? What, what drew them together? What was the common thread? Their death, the way they died. Did, how did they die? Says Zechariah was killed in a very similar way to Abel while he was busy near the altar. Mm -hmm. But I apologize. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that part. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's perfect. Because they both were what? What, were, what was the biggest thing that they both were considered? Righteous. Righteous. They exactly. were both righteous. Yeah. And both of them were killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's like the shedding of innocent blood. We see that. So basically, uh, I said, before we answer, let's look to commentary on the scripture from Matthew 23, <clears throat> 33 through 36 from Enduring Word. Will someone please read? From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of the rich. Yeah. Jesus here, <laughs> Jesus here spoke of all the righteous mar martyrs mm -hmm. of the Old Testament. Abel was clearly the first. And in the way that the Hebrew Bible was arranged, Zechariah was the last. Second Chronicles is the last book of the Hebrew Bible, and Zechariah's story is found in Second Chronicles chapter 24. Abel's blood cried out, Genesis, the fourth chapter, verse 10, and Zechariah asked that his blood be remembered, Second Chronicles 24, chapter 24, verse 22. All right, just to kind of just reinforce it. So thus, it does lead us to that very answer where it says they were both martyred because of the innocent blood that they shed at the hand of their accusers. Uh. 
Got it. Mm -hmm. All right, let us continue. So now we're going deeper into the 23rd chapter of Matthew, looking at verses 37 through 39. And will somebody please read that piece of scripture for us? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who <clears throat> kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until I say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hmm. So this um, is we see here a lot. And what I mean by that is that Jesus is speaking and basically he's speaking to the city of Jerusalem, basically saying, that, look what you did. You killed the, the prophets. You stoned those who sent to you and how he wanted just to kind of gather them together. I mean, basically he uses a reference of a mother hen kind of gathering her chicks under his wing. But instead of them coming close to the mother hen, basically they run away, you know. So basically he's saying, now look what you've done. The house is left deaf, desolate. And he said that you won't see me again in referencing to his second coming until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So now let's look deeper in this and look at commentary. Will someone please read uh, from Enduring Word? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Luke 19, 41 tells us that Jesus wept as he looked over the city of Jerusalem, thought about its coming judgment and said these words. Jesus wanted to protect them from the terrible judgment that would eventually follow their rejection of him. It is written that Jesus wept two times, here at the pain of knowing what would befall those who reject him, and also at the tomb of Lazarus, weeping at the power and pain of death. This heartfelt cry is another way to see that Jesus didn't hate these men. He rebuked so strongly. <clears throat> His heart broke for them. When we sin, God does not hate us. He genuinely sorrows for us, knowing that in every way our sin and rebellion only destroys our life. We should hope to share God's sorrow for lost humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Really, it's in the context, really. I mean, basically, I, I love that piece, and I always uh, talk about it, not in so many words, about like that last bit that the commentator said, uh, why Christianity, in my opinion, is just so awesome. Because basically, our God loves us so much that when we do wrong, he just wants us to do right. You know, he, he actually is sorrowful that we are doing wrong, you know, so it's just, and if we turn it around and come to him, I mean, look at the joy and reverence that he has, you know, basically looking at, of course, the 99, you know, basically the 99 being in the pen of the <clears throat> The one that was lost and how Jesus basically in reference said, hey, we rejoice and heaven is glad when that one comes into the fold. So it's just an awesome testimony to the, the power of the president, the president, excuse me, and the love of God. So I just I think it's awesome. Definitely awesome. Other thoughts. OK, all right. Let us continue and let, uh, let us also look at a little bit of background, because in that last commentary, it mentioned Luke. The scripture that we had read in Matthew didn't mention, you know, any weeping of Christ, but basically just kind of puts it all together. So will somebody please read for us Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 41 through 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, e if you even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is heading from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Hmm. So this, this actually in Luke is actually really profound because basically obviously Luke writes a phenomenal gospel. But then this basically we see how Jesus was actually heartbroken over Jerusalem. Obviously it says, as he saw it, he wept. 
But the piece of 43 through 44 actually is historical. We actually see in the time of the Romans, this it was actually destroyed. So actually we have not only uh, what Jesus said in the Bible, which we know is true, but we also have historical reference to the destruction of the temple as well. So it just kind of brings that full circle. And we're going to actually see that as we get into commentary after we look at this, of course, uh, study question. Well, some, uh, what I say, why did Jesus lament over the city of Jerusalem? Why was he upset about that? Because they had rejected him mm -hmm. and yes. had killed, mm -hmm. his, killed the prophets. And he knew what was going to happen to Jerusalem. You got it. You got it. You got it. So here we go. Because he knew, the knew of the coming tribulations that would befall this great city due to the fact that they rejected him. Yep. And see, it's funny, we can compare our lives to Jerusalem as well. You know, basically, he knows when we're going to get, as we like to say, out of pocket. He knows when we're going to do things that are not right. And he mm -hmm. sees what's coming. So he wants us to turn around and turn back into him. So, like I said, indeed, our Lord is sorrowful at that time for us because he knows what the outcome of our actions can be, as he knew what the outcome of the actions of those in leadership in Jerusalem would be and what it would bring for us. So yeah. let's look at some commentary, as I kind of mentioned to it before about that destruction. Will someone please read uh, Matthew 23 through 37, th uh, 37 through 39, uh, commentary from Enduring Word. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Jesus wanted to protect, nourish, and cherish his people the Jews, even as his mother, even as a mother bird protects the young chicks. The image of a hen, Greek is simply bird, protecting its young, is used in the Old Testament for God's protection of his people from Psalm 17, 8, 91, 4, Isaiah 31, 5, etc. Taken out of France. Let us continue the commentary. This picture of a go ahead. Okay. This picture of a hen and her chicks tells us something about what Jesus wanted to do for these who rejected him. He wanted to make them safe. He wanted to make them happy. He wanted to make them part of a blessed community. He wanted to promote their growth. He wanted them to know his love. And this can only happen if they came to him when he called. Mm. I love that how the commentary breaks it down. Because basically it says what Jesus wanted to happen in that instance. Keeping them safe. Obviously letting them happy. Being a part of that Christian or that blessed community. Making sure that they grew in his grace and of course his love. But the ending and the thing that it really hinges on. Obviously this is what he wants for you. But it can only happen if you turn to him. So basically, mm -hmm. that was the big run of it. There had to be that action where you changed and went to him, not you just saying these things. And basically, that's what mm -hmm. we're seeing. Basically, those empty vessels of those prophets, those scribes, those Herodians, basically, who were you know, trying to trick him and trying to keep what they thought was a legalistic government in place, not knowing that spiritual Messiah had come. And it's just... I tell you, it's just an interesting thing that we see, you know, definitely, especially in, in this commentary and in this scripture. Sorry. All righty. Will someone please continue in reading the commentary, looking at uh, Enduring Word, uh, verses 20, uh, 37 through 39. But you were not willing. The problem was not the willingness of Jesus to rescue and protect them. The problem was that they were not willing. Therefore, the predicted destruction would come upon them. You shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus here reveals something of the conditions surrounding his second coming. When Jesus comes again, the Jewish people will welcome him as the Messiah saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Till after the fullness of the Gentile is brought in, when the world, excuse me, when the word of life shall again be sent unto you, 
then will you rejoice and, and bless and praise him that cometh in the name of the Lord with full and final salvation for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <clears throat> it will take a great deal to bring Israel to that point, but God will do it. It is promised that Israel will welcome Jesus back, even as the Apostle Paul said in Romans eleven twenty six, and so all Israel will be saved. Mm. So basically, we see that even though there was going to be this destructive peace, basically there still is hope for salvation. And like I said, this basically just kind of moniker, uh, sorry, mimics our life as well. Obviously, even though we're going down these pathways of destruction, obviously when we're not walking in the way with Christ, there still is hope for redemption. There still is hope for salvation as well. So it just totally kind of puts it all together, especially in using this situation, of course, uh, of Jerusalem. Any other thoughts about it? Pastor, what does it mean when it says till after the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in? So basically, remember, when Jesus first came, he came for in the name of the Jewish religion, the Jews, of course. Right, the right. So the idea was the word would also be spread to Gentiles as well, meaning that it was going to be for all people. Everybody. You know, Jesus, when he first preached, went into those towns, but he said, you guys aren't giving it, so it's going to be given to somebody else. And of course, we see the rise of, of Acts, of course, the new church, and then the Apostle Paul, and, you know, thus the spread of Christianity into the land of Gentiles. Uh, but the funny thing about it is Jesus was doing it as well, because remember, if you weren't of Judaism faith, you were a Gentile. And of course, we see him in other countries, you know, with the, the lady, uh, with the woman, sorry, the woman whose uh, daughter was, you know, demon possessed, you know, talking about even the dogs take the crumbs of their master, you know, yeah. so we see him spreading that. So that's what it is. It's supposed to be a fullness for everyone, Jew, Gentile, Greek, to know that line, to know uh, Jesus. Yeah, so that's it. But yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. Cool. So, all right, here we go. So what house was left desolate and what does this mean? I really want you to think on this one. This, was, this is a unique one. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack with this question. <laughs> so what house was left desolate? As I was reading, it mm -hmm. said your house. Okay. Which is our house or the people that he was speaking to mm -hmm. at that time. Gotcha. All right. All right. Yes. And there we, we're getting there. Come on. Anyone else? Hmm. All right. Let's just go forth in. Uh, what does it mean that your house is left to you desolate? Looking at Matthew 23 and 38 from God questions. Let us look to the commentary. Will somebody please read? At the end of the Okay. Go, go ahead, ahead, Melissa. No, Ma, go ahead. Uh-uh, baby. Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> At the end of Matthew 23, as Jesus excoriates the scribes and Pharisees for their behavior, he says, look, your house is left to you desolate. In verse 38, Jesus spoke this prophecy regarding the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. There is a twofold meaning of the temple being left desolate or abandoned. First, Jesus, who is God in human form, was departing from the temple for the last time, leaving it deserted of the divine presence. God was forsaking their beautiful house of worship, leaving it spiritually empty and ripe for destruction. In Matthew 23, 39, Jesus promises the Jews that they will see him no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At that time, Israel will be saved and the Jews will be converted to faith in their true Messiah. See Romans 11, 25 through 27. Let us continue. It says the second meaning of your house is left desolate to you refers to the physical destruction of the temple, which will be desolated in 40 years when the Romans invaded Jerusalem in AD 70. Shortly after Jesus' pronouncement that your house is if left <clears throat> to you desolate, his disciples pointed to the buildings of the temple, noting how wonderful the architecture and adornments were. There must have been shock to hear Jesus describe the future state of the temple. These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall be thrown down, Luke 21 through 6. Such was the sad desolation in store for Jerusalem, the temple and the people who rejected their Messiah. Will someone please continue? 
about a week prior to Jesus' statement that your house is left to you desolate, he had cleansed the temple. At that time, Jesus had said, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Luke 19, uh, 46. The difference between my house and your house is striking. The temple belonged to God, but evil men had profaned it, requiring Jesus cleansing. Then as Jesus exited for the last time, he called it your house. That is, it was no longer God's, but theirs. They had, wrestled, they had wrested control of God's house and objected to the Lord's right to oversee it. In return, God forsook it, leaving it open to devastation. Hmm. I just love that, how he put that together as far as a commentary. And I say he, I should say whoever wrote it, <laughs> but just basically giving us that true understanding of basically how the I am your, you know, basically when Jesus yeah. was there, he was saying, it was me, I'm here with you, but you're rejecting me. So now this belongs to you. <laughs> I will not dwell in an unclean vessel. <laughs> so basically that gives us just that true understanding of basically the coldness that was probably, well, obviously they didn't feel that they didn't even understand it, but when Jesus actually left. So I tell you, it's just, it's just very interesting and striking. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it says, Jesus got no satisfaction out of this sad prediction regarding the temple. In fact, he lamented uh, in, in its destruction and especially the fate of the people. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent, who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as hens gathered her chicks under her wings and you are not willing, Matthew 23 and 37. Luke describes how Jesus wept over the temple fate that awaited the city and its inhabitants, Luke 19 and 21. Historical records, including those of Josephus, describe in detail the Roman invasion, confirming that Jesus' prophecy, your house is left a desolate, came true. Mm. So we see basically, as I was referencing before uh, in our first, uh, in our introduction to tonight's lesson, talking about how we see not only just the Bible's account, which is the word and the truth, but we also see historical reference to that destruction too as well. So a lot of people say, well, hey, you know, you're just saying that, well, it was seen in other places as well. The Bible is true and Jesus said it and it did happen. So it just further validates what, uh, what Jesus said about uh, Jerusalem. So let us get to study question 2H. And it says, the temple in Jerusalem, it was twofold. The spiritual loss of not accepting Jesus as Messiah and the physical destruction of the temple by the Romans. So basically remember what the first part of the question was the temple in Jerusalem. And of course, the second answer to it would be, it was twofold. The spiritual loss of not accepting Jesus as Messiah and the physical destruction of the temple by the Romans. Hmm. And it's interesting. And basically, I tried to find true, like, historical pieces about the Romans. And there's a lot of stories about it, but I can't validate it. But I know they were saying in one of them where when they were uh, going around the temple, they had surrounded it in the destruction. And remember, as we see here, this is, of course, the new thing that is built. But it also had gold inlays. And they were speaking about how the gold dripped down the walls, you know, and they were just burning it because they totally destroyed it. You know, so basically... Hmm. It was just given accounts, you know, basically that destruction uh, at that time. So it's just just interesting. You know, like I said, the source that I got it from, I couldn't validate, but it was just neat to kind of at least get that witness or uh, picture of it because Jesus said there won't be one stone that's left unturned, you know, and then you see this account that was set out by the gold of the inlay even melting, you know, saying that the building was totally, totally destroyed. All righty. Let us go into now the 24th chapter of uh, Matthew, and basically uh, we'll see uh, this open up to us a little more. Will somebody please read Matthew 24, verses 1 through 5? Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. 
as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will the sign of the coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Mm -hmm. hmm. We see in opening up this 24th, obviously it kind of goes back and forth as Jesus basically after he had done those rebukes, it was walking out of the temple. And of course, again, it talks about the disciples and how they were enamored at the architecture to see these great things. And then Jesus said, I know you see these great things now, but this is going to be destroyed, you know? And so then he goes, uh, and as he goes into the Mount of Olives, the disciples come to him and say, you know, well, when will these things be? What will be the sign? And Jesus first gave them a warning and said, watch out that nobody deceives you. You know, for many will come in his name saying that he was the Messiah and deceive many. So basically, uh, we see that piece of it. So will someone please just read a little commentary concerning Matthew 24, verses 1 through 5. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Jesus would contend no more with the religious leaders and never again come to the temple in his earthly ministry. With emphasis, he went out and departed. His disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. After the destruction of Solomon's temple, this temple was originally built by Zerubbabel and Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, verse 15. Herod the Great, who ruled when Jesus was born, greatly expanded and improved it. This temple was the center of Jewish life for almost a thousand years, so much so that it was customary to swear by the temple, Matthew 23, uh, verse 16. And speaking against the temple could be considered blasphemy, Acts chapter 6, verse 13. Hmm. Well, I think the commentary here puts it kind of the magnitude of that temple's destruction. Imagine something being the center of society and life for almost a thousand years. I mean, years, yeah. <laughs> just, I mean just uh, uh, obviously America's not even 300 yet. You know what I mean? But we feel mm -hmm. like it'll never go anywhere. You know, but imagine something being that historic and being that old and basically Jesus saying, you know what? It looks great. They've done a lot of things with it in a thousand years, but it's going to be destroyed, you know? <laughs> so it's just so interesting and so earth shattering that must have been for his disciples who obviously believed to hear him say something like that, knowing their great grandparents, their, their grandparents, great grandparents had seen this temple, you know, had seen this, you know, this historic piece. So it really kind of puts it together as far as in that. <laughs> Any other thoughts? All right, we'll continue. Will someone please read, uh, continue, or we'll just kind of end tonight, of course, with this piece of the commentary. Will someone please read for us? Do you not see all these things? The disciples wanted Jesus to look at the beautiful buildings. Jesus told them to turn around and take a good look at all those things. Not one stone shall be left here upon another. Some 40 years after Jesus said this, there was a widespread Jewish revolution against the Romans in Palestine, and they enjoyed many early successes. But ultimately, Roman soldiers crushed the rebels. In AD 70, Ju uh, Jerusalem was leveled, including the temple, just as Jesus said would happen. Mm -hmm. So we see that basically that destruction. Yeah. 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 Took that time, but it looked look at what happened. Like I said, that prophecy that he put out definitely did not fall to deaf ears. You know, so mm -hmm. it definitely is something to kind of show. And like I said, not only does it have a biblical reference, but also historical reference as well. So definitely. Mm -hmm. a good oh, go ahead. Oh, I thought somebody said something. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, like I said, so definitely uh, kind of brings it full circle. Good. Yeah. So any thoughts, any comments, any concerns or questions? Another good lesson. Mm -hmm. I'll be the glory. Uh, the, word is always the more good. we study, the more I learn. Yeah, like, yeah uh, it does. It brings, yeah. it, it really yeah. brings it out. I'm not gonna lie to you because mm -hmm. I, 
totally remember even myself the, the Cain and Abel story, but I, I didn't realize that God spoke to him. You know, like right, really, I didn't. You don't have to do this. <laughs> like you don't right. have to do this. <laughs> but obviously, of course, we see it. So, and it, and it's funny to me. I even think about those times in you know between, of course, Adam and Eve and their offspring actually having just a direct relationship. Obviously, we have a relationship with God, but mm -hmm. just talking to him, you know, and He's mm -hmm. there and He's telling you these things, and it's just. I tell you, I, we can only envision what the other side will look like, you know, seriously, just to be in his presence in that way. I think it's just, just awesome. Just awesome. Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh, any other, any other comments? All righty. All right. Well, if all hearts and minds are set, I'm going to just ask Sister Jackson, will you please close us out this evening? I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, you were sir. calling a hot mic. Right? Now, you know, you kind of put your head down and hope the teacher don't call you in the classroom. <laughs> no, I'm just having a flashback. No, I'm good. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> if all minds are clear, all heads bow, please. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, we want to thank you for another good lesson. We want to thank you for Pastor Stacy and the time that he's taken to explain things to us, even to do his homework and to bring us the lesson. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for everyone down here. Yes, and Lord, I want to thank you for my friend, Barbara. And I pray that she's okay, even though she was very quiet tonight. <laughs> Please be with her. And then, Father, I want to thank you for all those that are missing tonight. Keep yes, them in your prayers. Yes, and I want to thank you for everything. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Truly to God be the glory. We're just so thankful for sharing tonight, just having a good time together, to fellowship. And Sister Melissa, I say I still love you, even you got that weird thing on your head. But it's okay. <laughs> uh, why are you laughing? Where are your cup? You didn't see your cup, huh? <laughs> what do you got on it? Oh, man, I tell you. <laughs> And all the pillows right now yeah. say gay. They say gay. Yeah. Hey, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I can say it's the off season, so I can try my hardest now. Because in season, I'm going to be real quiet. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. But everyone have a blessed evening. Enjoy, enjoy. Stay safe. Like they say, it's supposed to be wet tomorrow. So be careful on the roadway. Yes. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes. Right. Looking forward to seeing all of you. God bless. All, all right. right. Good, good night, day. everyone. Good night. All right. Good night.